Labor Talks, recorded at Chippewa Valley Community Television in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Hi, welcome to Labor Talks. I'm Lori Gruber, the host. I'm the secretary of the Labor Council here in town. And um, our special guest today is Chuck Slobodnik. Did I pronounce that right? Yes, you did. Thank you. And he is from the American Postal Workers uh, Local 102 here in town. Welcome. Thanks for coming, Chuck. Well, thank you for the inviting us today, Amari. Okay. Um, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about you? Okay. Uh, I am the Vice President of the American Postal Workers Union Local 102 here in Eau Claire, and we cover the zip codes 547, anything that starts with 547 and 548, so basically northwestern Wisconsin. Um, if an employee has a problem or a question, safety or health issue, or whatever the case may be that they would like union involvement, then um, we give them assistance either on site or by phone, whatever it takes. And I'm past president of our local. I'm getting uh, near retirement age, so I didn't run again as president, but I'm vice president. And uh, as vice president, um, I basically do whatever the president asks me to do. <laughs> Delegation. Yes. And uh, I've been with the post office um, since 1973, right out of high school. I, I graduated at 17 and started work for the post office. And I worked in the largest post office in the world, the Chicago Post Office. Oh. And uh, that's no longer there. They tore it down about 10 years ago, but the freeway used to go right underneath the post office, six lanes of it. Wow. And um, uh, I've served almost in every capacity within the, within the union, from a clerk craft director. I started out as a union steward uh, and worked my way all, up all the way till president. So it's been a very enjoyable 42-year career for me. And your wife is a retired teacher, correct? Yes, and my wife Mary taught uh, kindergarten for 35 years uh, as a teacher uh, within the uh, uh, private school system. Okay, and you've got several children, right? Yes, uh, I, we've got uh, together. We've got four kids. Uh, our daughter is a director at a violence center here in a private. A uh, nonprofit center here in Eau Claire that uh, uh, victims of domestic abuse can go to, uh, and uh, if they need help, she accompanies them through any court proceedings or and gives them advice and counseling, whatever shelter, whatever the case may be. Uh, and our son is a special education teacher, following along with Mary's. Uh, behind Mary as a special education teacher in the Bronx, New York City. Oh, wow, in New York. And uh, uh, it's called, um, geez, I forget the name of the school now, the American School, uh, I forget. Uh, and I have two other daughters then, and they're stay-at-home moms. We need them too. Yes, that's for sure. <laughs> we need them too. The most important job. <laughs> well, we're saying that education starts at home. And if the children aren't educated somewhat before they go to school, it makes it so much harder to glean what they need to from school because they're com you know you don't want them like this with the teachers they can be lost and if they if they have that education to start and that's where the parents come in they've got to start that education that's exactly right that's you're absolutely right yeah. um, now I know that there are several unions within the post office operations yes Do you, can you tell us what those are Yes, we've got about uh, six layers of, of unions for each craft. So we have the American Postal Workers Union, which I belong to, and that's the clerks that distribute the mail to all the cities of wherever mail goes to. And then we have our, our brothers and our sisters in the NALC, the National Association of Letter Carriers, and they um, process and deliver all the mail for all, all the cities within the United States. And in rural areas, uh, we have a rural un uh, union, that's the Rural Letter Carriers Union, and our brothers and sisters usually drive a vehicle on the routes out to all the rural areas in the United States. Because um, we deliver to every house in the United States six days a week. That's uh, something that nobody else reaches the public like we do. Like you guys do. Um, we have our mail handlers union. Um, they load and unload trucks. They do the heavy lifting for the Postal Service. Uh, even our management organizations have their unions, uh, from the National Association of Postal Supervisors to uh, the Postmasters Organization, which is called NAPES, National Association of Postmasters of the United States. So I think that's five or six unions that uh, 
that participate um, working in the post office. In the post offices. And you currently work at the Hogarth branch yes. of the post office here in Eau Claire. Can you tell us what that building has been used for in the last several years? Yes, it was built in uh, 1997. Prior to that, we were at uh, Barstow Street. Uh, now, it's, now it's a parking. I was going to say that's not even there now. <laughs> uh, when I started, when I came to Eau Claire in 1982, uh, all the process, all the mail was processed on Barstow Street uh, for the city of Eau Claire and 547 zip codes and 548 zip codes and then brought to truck out to the outlying areas in 547 and 548. Hogar Street sorts all the mail for every 547 zip code uh, in northwestern Wisconsin and also 548 zip codes which is Spooner all the way up to Superior. Uh, so we still process a lot of mail going out to those offices. However, about 2013, we lost the canceling the stamp where it said Eau Claire, Wisconsin, now says uh, Minneapolis, or it says St. Paul. We lost that in 2013. That was part of a plan where to avoid bankruptcy, uh, the post office was losing a lot of money and they, f they felt that, well, if we can save $3 billion, we can close 252 plants nationwide out of uh, 461. Um, they've succeeded in that so far. They've closed two-thirds of those 251 plants nationwide. How many here in Wisconsin? And in Wisconsin, we lost five. We lost Wausau, where their canceling operations are now done in uh, Green Bay. Uh, I don't know if Madison is closed yet, but targeted in 2015 was Madison, Wausau, uh, Kenosha, Portage, Spooner, La Crosse closed almost completely. Uh, so Madison, La Crosse, Kenosha, Spooner, Wausau, and Portage. I don't know where Madison is yet because that's of course that's where our of course our elected officials are and I don't know that they've allowed that mail to be canceled in Milwaukee or not yet but I, I'm sure our brothers and sis sisters in Mo uh, Madison know what's going on there. And. I live in an outlying area, in part of the ones you I'm in a 540, which also used to come through here and then would go oh, sure. over to Minneapolis, St. Paul. Yes. And I've seen a slowdown in the delivery time because of the fact that that distribution center is not there anymore and having, it, have, having to go through Minneapolis. What led up to the government thinking that closing distribution centers was a good thing? Uh, that uh, Actually, it wasn't the government. It was the post office itself, the postmaster general. Uh, was key behind to closing, stopping Saturday delivery. Uh, they felt that uh, to stop the bleeding, they, could, they felt that they could save $3 billion by closing all these plants and by moving up, consolidating operations. And in fact, most people do realize when you go to your mailbox, there's maybe half the letters or, or a third of the letters even in some cases or even less of first class mail now because of uh, the recession was a, took us a big hit. The internet was a big hit for us. Uh, so now we're making up the business and the monies from package delivery, thankfully. We handle 30% of FedEx's packages ground segment. We handle about 40% of UPS ground segment. In other words, when you deliver or you uh, take your package to FedEx or UPS, there's a good chance 30, 40% of it's going to be delivered by us. They, they have the higher surcharge. They we're the cheapest in the world. Where else can you go for 49 cents with a, with, uh, for, a letter? for a letter? We're the only institution in the United States Constitution from 1775 that exists today that the co Congress has right to establish post offices. We're the people's post office. We're, we don't belong to the United States government. We're the people's post office. Every person has ownership in the post office. And we need to survive. We're the cheapest in the world. We're the cheapest out of private, our private competitors, FedEx and UPS. And UPS. A lot of people don't realize that. Like when a grocery store gets big or a Walmart, and they add a, at their customer service, they add a little bank and they add a little post office. That's not you guys. No. And that's jobs that's being taken away from the local post office. Uh, that's true. That's free. How, who else can have a, a product and you can sell it for free in another, in another area? Um, the problem with that is that um, people can mail, they're not as trained as our people are, uh, our postal employees. Things can slip by. 
Um, we've had some cases where uh, well, we had the Unabomber uh, who uh, for 10 years was mailing letters in the post office and that's why there's a requirement now of anything over 13 ounces or more you have to bring into a postal clerk or you have to present it over a counter. The problem is the people at Walmart or Staples, uh, they're not, they don't get the training that we do. Uh, to, to explain to you uh, what our services are. In fact, so many com when people have complaints after something gets messed up at Staples or Walmart, wherever they drop their letters off at uh, some of our local grocery stores, uh, we have to, they come to us to fix it. You know, where's my package? Uh, we probably get 50 calls a day of, uh, we, I, went, I went to Mega Foods, Festival Foods, uh, Gordy's, and we had a problem because they can't afford this under people to two weeks of school, uh, or in our case, uh, two weeks to 30 days of, of, of training and classroom training so that we can tell you what, what you can do, what's the best value for your dollar, what exactly you might need from registered mail to exp overnight delivery to uh, how we can best serve you. Well, and, and like I said, I've, I spend quite a bit of time up at Hogarth with you guys because we do the bulk mailing newsletter for the Labor Council. And I was part of the, the Postal Commission that came through and did the, we got a tour oh. with the Chippewa Valley, you know. Yes. And I think yes. it's very beneficial and educational, and I think anybody who does, wants to understand what the Postal Service does should come on one of those tours, should come talk to you guys. I mean, it seems to be a really good way to get educated on what it is you guys do. It isn't just a matter of dropping the mail off in our mailbox. It's getting it from you to me and, and everywhere in between. Um, I also understand, Chuck, that the Postal Service right now is required to put money into a pension 75 years in advance. Um, I don't know of any other entity that is required to do that. You're putting money away in pensions for people that aren't even born yet. Now, from what I see, that's probably what's put, I mean, yes, there's the internet and everything else, but wouldn't yes. you agree that that's one of the reason, main reasons why the Postal Service is in the shape it's It is. In? It is the main reason. Um, when Congress, uh, President Bush and the Congress passed uh, in 2006 the Postal Enhancement uh, Act, the Postal Act of 2006 that, that required the post office to pay into the health, the health retirees' health insurance fund, the postal pension fund, uh, up to 75 years. We were prime. We were black. We were overflowing in money. Uh, we reached our peak uh, in 2006 with about 98 billion pieces of mail in 2006. Today we're at about 78 billion. Uh, Congress, um, the Congressional Research Office projects that by, uh, we'll, we'll lose our mail volume, will be cut in half by 2020 from what it is today. Uh, fortunately, again, the package delivery business has been increasing for us about 5% a year, so it's kind of balanced at least the 5% volume we lose in first class mail, which is the bread and butter used to be of the Postal Service. Um, there's 617,000 employees in the post office. We're the third largest employer in the United States. Um, we have the uh, we also have the largest fleet of vehicles uh, in the country. Uh, people don't realize, but just a penny uh, increase in the in the cost of gas cost um, forty million dollars uh, a year for just a, every every penny increase that the price of gas goes up for having the largest fleet of vehicles in the country. Um, rural rural America was particularly hurt by uh, by closing all our post offices. They closed a lot of post offices, yes. And where they couldn't close them, uh, they've agreed to leave them open for two hours, four hours, or six hours a day. Yeah, I think These ours is open too. <laughs> two hours a day. So uh, that hurt, who does that hurt? That hurts the America, that, that hurts the people, hurts everybody. It, it hurts our relatives, our friends. Um, so we hope that people realize that it's not up, uh, we, d we should decide whether the post office stays open or not. We need to tell our congressmen and our legislatures that, hey, we own the post office, we want it to stay open, it's the cheapest in the world. Um, there's nothing cheaper than 49 cents today. Do you see any way of reversing or maybe mediating that amount that they're, you guys are being mandated to put away? Uh, what would definitely help would be the, when, when we had paradise, when we, when we controlled both Congresses, the, the Senate, uh, the House of Representatives, and we had uh, post, uh, President Obama and we passed the, 
Affordable Care Act. Um, it, it would take those three planets to align again, I think, to, to halt Congress uh, accountable to halt them closing the post offices because they can they did stop close they did stop Saturday delivery of the post office wanted to stop Saturday delivery and the Congress said no. Uh, unfortunately even President Obama said okay but the Congress thankfully overruled him and uh, we still have Saturday mail delivery because we still need medications people in rural areas need their medicine and in the cities uh, those deliveries on um, on Saturdays, and those sometimes those deliveries are with ice packs with cold medicines that have to be delivered. You close the post office down, what's left? UPS doesn't, they deliver Monday through Friday. Who delivers on Saturday? We do. Uh, so. But I think that's another misconception people have is the days that you guys deliver and who can control that. When they were like, well, we don't need our mail on Saturday, so. Well, you may not, but you know what? My mom might, who's 88 and gets her things delivered at home. And also with, right. with the newer systems coming up like Amazon Prime, where they're shipping so many packages. I mean, I've even yes. heard of Sunday deliveries yes. from the post office. Yes, 15 major metropolitan areas uh, started out with Amazon on Sunday deliveries. When I first started with the post office, I collected mail out of your mailboxes in, uh, in uh, 1978 on Sunday deliveries. That's all I did all day was hit about 80 mailboxes in the city of Chicago and drove around all day and gathered the mail. That's when mail was popular before the internet. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right, uh, Congress can control that and did control it and they control the post office, like I say, for 1775. They have the power and uh, they have the power of the people and we hope that uh, Congress listens to the people and hopefully this election cycle uh, will be fortunate again. I worry that with them seeing that bulk of money sitting there, just like they did with Social Security, just like they're looking at the Wisconsin, Walker's looking at Wisconsin retirement, I yes. worry that they're going to say, oh, there's this money over here we can take from to pay something else. Are there good firewalls or good restrictions in place so they cannot do that? Fortunately, yes and no. Uh, the post office, you know, the, there are those that want to privatize the post office because that's an easy $70 billion a year that people would like to get a, get a hold of. Uh, we deliver 40% of the world's mail. Uh, it's the cheapest in the world. And just think of the profits. Uh, by the Constitution, we're break, we're break even. We, we, we're not for profit. That's why the stamps are 49 cents. That's why we're the cheapest in the world, uh, the cheapest in America because we're not for profit. And uh, where else, what other institution since 7075 has, has been able to um, thrive and be in existence? We're one of the few and we need the people of the American public to stand behind us, not to take away our post office because it belongs to all of us, my parents and all our friends and relatives, uh, all of us. It seems like the busiest times for the post office is Christmas, yes. of course, and elections. Yes. that's. And it's uh, the integrity of the mail is, uh, you know, in the post office, if you mail a letter, uh, the police can't open up your mail unless they have a court order. Uh, in, in FedEx and UPS, uh, there's no guarantees that your mail uh, is, is going to be secure. Or if you go through sometimes uh, some of these third parties, uh, Walmart or some of the grocery stores that um, handle, in fact, there's been some problems. but. Uh, the most secure is going to your neighborhood post office, supporting your post office, um, telling your legislatures that you want your post office open. You demand that the post office stay open to serve you, not just from uh, 8 to 4 or 10 to 12 when it's convenient for the post office, uh, but when you get home from work. Right, because otherwise we have to find a post office somewhere else. And I think a lot of times they don't understand, and even the people in, in like my town might not understand, that postmaster lived in town. That yes. letter carrier lives in town. And if you take that post office and take it down to two hours, I can't get there while they're open because they're open in the middle of the day and I'm over here. So now nice. I'm going to come see you guys. And not that that's a bad thing, but right. it would be nice to be able to support my own community. So people yeah. need to understand that they need to support their own post offices by going in there. Support the people who live in your area um, and, and encourage your legislators to keep you know, to work to keep those post offices open. Do you see way, a way 
where we can educate our legislators as to the real issues at the Postal Service, especially since they're the ones making the decisions. They, and, and fortunately, uh, we have Senator Tammy Baldwin, who's behind the post office 100%, and then on the other hand, we've got to get, again, another U.S. Senator that's not so supportive. Uh, again, I don't know if they see sometimes $70 billion and, and would like to get their hands in that. But people, um, you know, we try to educate the public and when uh, folks come into the post office. I work also as a window clerk as well as a bulk mail technician, uh, so I deal with the public every day. And, uh, and, and it's frustrating sometimes to see a line outside the door because the post office uh, uh, sometimes doesn't, it lacks the staffing sometimes properly. If you go into a post office and there's a long line, nobody likes to see that. And we try to keep the wait times down to five minutes or less. Um, but if you see problems, report them to your postmaster and to your, and to your congressman, your legislatures, that we, we're having these problems. And that's what they're there for, is to look into problems in the federal, in the federal agencies. That's one of their um, uh, things they're supposed to keep an eye on, and they do, uh, for the most part. Um, but it's, um, again, it's the People's Post Office, and once something is gone, it's gone, as we all know. And it's hard to get it back once it's gone. And that's definitely true, um, especially uh, that we're the only one that's mandated to go to everybody's house six days a week by the Constitution. And, and a lot of times people don't understand what they lost until it's gone. It, that's and then they blame the wrong people for the reason that it's gone. Yes. Do you have, or how are you doing on recruiting new young people into the union? You know, our problem is right now the new, our new employees, we're 50% membership, 50, in other words, 50% of our new hires in, in a sh and the problem is, is in the smaller offices because we don't have the communication to tell them about the benefits um, of joining the union, of, of a living wage, um, uh, keeping up with inflation, the value of our contract. Um, uh, in fact, it, it's amazing in, in our own union, uh, we get free, if, you, if you're diabetic or you have heart problems, you get free prescriptions, free medicine, which can amount to thousands of dollars. That's what our union provides because it's a not-for-profit not health plan. Uh, it's just amazing. Um, but anyway, uh, we need to communicate better with new members uh, because right now only 50% are enrolled in a union. They don't see the value of it. Okay. Um, but when they get their paychecks, they do because we start at least $15 an hour, which uh, someday hopefully we'll, we'll have a living wage for everybody. And employees to work at the post office have to take the civil service exam, correct? Yes, they do. And how, what, how is the post office, how, how is the postal union looking at this new attack on workers, on the attacking the civil service jobs? And well, civil service now has been replaced by, uh, we're getting old, or about baby boomers retirement age. Um, it's still civil service um, in a sense that um, you have to pass the test, you have to pass the background uh, checks and no criminal record, have a safe driving record, um, like many other jobs and corporations. Um, but um, uh, we try to do our best to educate our employees, though, and the public. And your seniority is protected with the, w the laws as they are now, yes, where with the attack that they're trying to do now, they're gonna, that's not gonna, that could go away. Uh, Walker, you know, started a big thing. Uh, unions, uh, what did they, how did he put it? He put it that it's an entitlement to, to some people uh, in the Republican Party. And, uh, but our unions uh, made this country. Um, it's, it's, the wages thrive when unions thrived. And, as, and the correlation is similar as the union membership declined, the wages declined. Um, so uh, we have no layoff clause. We're one of the few, again, unions that have a no layoff clause that if once you're there for six years, uh, we hope to continue that trend for the past uh, 40 years or so, uh, that we have a no layoff clause. Uh, fortunately, we, we have about 40,000 employees retire every year. So our rates of attrition are, are high, and those jobs are only replaced probably by maybe a third or 20%. Uh, so for... Uh, you know, uh, for all the employees that re that retire, we only have maybe um, 10,000 coming in and 40,000 going out. So we're able to balance our budget that way as well. 
Well, I know there's a lot of them shifting around, too. I mean, you lost several of your people that moved over to Minneapolis or Rochester. Yes. And uh, So when they get a pink slip, uh, they don't lose their job, but they have to go to, uh, our folks went up to Egan, Minneapolis. They followed the mail where our mail went to, where it's being canceled. Which that means now. uprooting their families and moving and someplace that moves else. That, well, so we've lost 50 jobs in Eau Claire. That, that's, uh, 50, you know, times maybe over $50,000 times 50 employees. That's a big impact for the Eau Claire community and all these other cities that Taxpayers I mentioned. Taxpayers here and, here and people that helped our community. Right. You know, I'm not saying well, Minneapolis, St. Paul doesn't need it, but we need our, our jobs here. We do want to keep the jobs here. And um, that was something that um, uh, uh, it's going to be hard to get back now uh, once, you, once we lost the once canceling. Once you lose something, it. it's hard to get it back. So Eau Claire's not on the postage stamp anymore, unfortunately, like the other five cities, Madison, Kenosha, sure. Portage, and Wausau. Our major cities. Our major towns. Um, is there any other thing that you can add that would, as a way forward for the postal worker unions today? What do you see as that way forward? Oh, we've got a lot of uh, we've got a lot of educating to do, and um, you know the newspapers have been good uh, as far as publishing our stories when we need help. Um, it's been it was well publicized in the newspapers and on radio in Eau Claire on the TV that, hey, we're closing our plants. We're going to take away your post office. Uh, and, and we lost 50 jobs because of that. So unfortunately, there was no public outcry. They had a little Let's bit of a thing j just because all of a sudden their, their pla the post office downtown was gone and they had to go a little bit further away to come see you guys. You heard a little bit then, but true, it's when people lose their what's easy for them. Then they start waking up, I think, to what's going on out that's, there. That's true, and we need so we need a lot of help from from everybody for that. Um, because it, everybody owns a post office, everybody has a mailbox in front of their house. So again, uh, I w uh, we hope that people realize it's their post office, it's the people's post office, and no one has right to take that away from them. Okay. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to add? Uh, no, uh, again, thank you for the opportunity and, uh, and up to your viewing audience and I hope uh, I've been able to share a little bit of uh, history with, with folks and how, how it's the most treasured uh, entities in, in that we have in and, and we don't want to lose it. Thank, so thank you for this opportunity. Well, thank you. That's today's program and, and my thanks to our viewing audience and to you, Chuck, because today's program wouldn't have been available, you know, a possible without you, so I appreciate you coming, well, thank you, coming on again. to us. Uh, my thanks also to the folks that work behind our cameras, um, who not only make this show possible, but give us as union members a, a voice, a place for our voice to be heard. Chippewa Valley Community Television is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, you can contact us by calling 715-839-5067 or on the web at www.cbctv.org.